want to welcome you to our time of worship this morning. And um, I just want to start with a little encouragement. Um, and I know this happens all the time. I know it happens every week. But for some reason, it's been on my heart that, you know, we've been barraged, especially as a, a, a church, a people of the word. You look at the headlines and you watch the news and you scan the mass media and, and all of those things. And it's really easy to get discouraged. It's really easy to be just kind of distracted and consumed with the stuff that's going on out there. <clears throat> and it's even easy to get, to fall for the trap that that's reality. You know, that that's the real world. And to some extent, I understand what that means, that, you know, we face a world of darkness, we live in a world of, of compromise. I understand that. But from a Christian perspective, a biblical perspective, that is not reality. Reality is what we find in Scripture. Reality is what we find in the principles and character of God. And all of the headlines and all the media stuff is what's going on here. But Scripture says we've been saved from the world of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of His beloved Son, Jesus. That's what you see in the news, what you read in the memes and the Twitter and the Facebook and everything else, the newscasts, that is not reality. Truth is what we find in the character of God and in His Word. So I hope you're making time. You know, I, I mentioned in, in one of my devotionals this week that one thing I learned in the restaurant was that it takes a lot of good to offset a little bit of bad. You know, they used to say that nine, it took nine positive uh, reviews to offset one negative review in, in a restaurant. There's something about the negative that grabs our attention and we want to hang on to it. I don't know what it is subconsciously. But there's a reason that Philippians 4 says, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is good repute, Focus on these things. And the peace of God, I'm jumping down now, and the peace of God will consume, will, will um, translate your, your heart to what is right. And so I just want to encourage you. It, it, with all the stuff going on around us, we have an opportunity here on a Sunday morning to gather with the saints, to focus our attention on that which is good and true and right. And I, I hope that that offsets, you know, a little bit of what you're getting uh, or surrounded with, barraged by in the, the hype around us. So I just want to start with that encouragement. Push it all aside right now and let's spend time with one another, the people of God and with his word. And let's let that be our guide here this morning. Um, I got up this morning, was getting ready, looked on the front, out on the front yard, and right by, I mean, within 10, 10 yards, there was a doe just working her way across the front yard, um, nibbling on the grass and then the bushes and shrubs that we have uh, there. And I'm just watching this doe just working its way around, not a care in the world. Every once in a while it would lift its head, look around, and then it would just keep <clears throat> going. And this morning we're sitting here praying, and all of a sudden a, a flock of geese fly over, apparently without a care in the world. And I thought, Lord, I can't remember the last time when I just had that kind of relaxed, thinking about the dough especially, that kind of just not thinking about anything else other than, in her mind, you know, just eating, getting, just relaxed. It didn't seem like anything bothered her. And that was really something that challenged me, how often life creeps in, how often the cares of this world consume. And it's so hard to just relax. You know, when I mentioned the passage from Philippians chapter 4, whatever is right, true, honorable, all these, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds. So much of our world 
And I say that personally convicting as well. It's so consumed with the stuff around us that peace is evasive, elusive. And to just say, Lord, I don't have to carry this burden. And sin is one of those things, our failures, our faults. To try to carry it and to gain peace. I'm sorry, folks, it doesn't work that way. One of the things that you need to do, if you really want that kind of peace that passes all understanding, is to lay those burdens down at the foot of the cross. Is to confess your sin and to allow the peace of Christ to rule. And so we do that at the beginning of every service. We take the time to go to the foot of the cross, to lay our sins, our faults, our failures down, those things that separate us from God and his peace. And so we're going to do that now as we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you indeed for your mercy and grace. We thank you for the amazing privilege to be able to come to you and to dump all of that stuff that competes for our attention, that competes for that place in our hearts that only you should fill. And so, Lord, we come to you now. We confess our sins before you, even now. Dear Lord, your word has promised that when we come to you in humility and brokenness, when we do indeed acknowledge you as Savior and Lord, you strip away those things that burden our hearts and minds. When we focus on those things that are right and true and good, your character and your word, you are faithful and just, your word says. You forgive our sins and you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for that amazing mercy. In your name, amen. Amen. Come home. Come home. What a wonderful message. To, to think of God, our Heavenly Father. Remember the story of the prodigal? How many nights he must have stood by the gate hoping, yearning, maybe even calling for his prodigal to come home. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we sang that song, to hear the cry of your heart, even of your lips, come home, come home. Oh, how you must weep when so many of your children are straying, wandering around in darkness when they could have the wonderful experience of being welcomed home. Lord, we do pray for those that are lost, those who don't know you. And Lord, we pray for those that have tasted the sweetness of being in your family and then for whatever reason have become distracted and, and walked away from you. We pray that they would return to come back to the sheepfold where you indeed have every good and perfect gift waiting for them. Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts now as we look at your word. May we be challenged and transformed. May your Holy Spirit speak clearly and boldly through your word this morning. In your name, amen. Amen. We've spent several weeks talking about the I am statements. We've seen the I am going back to Abraham, I'm sorry, uh, Moses, time in the uh, the burning bush and God saying, my name is I am. We have seen Jesus trying to explain to not only his followers, but those around uh, the whole idea that he and the Father are one. This idea of using the identity of I am as a way to understand Jesus' purpose and ministry. As we have seen so far, that was not welcomed. Um, they understood what he meant by I am, and it was not received. 
We have seen as Jesus has tried so many times to get their attention, and it was not received. But one of the things we haven't really looked at is how often, because we just haven't had time, how often these I am statements were accompanied by various miracles. Um, As we look at many of the past statements and those that will come in the future, many of them, when Jesus uh, is trying to teach the people, he's building on something that he has already shown them or will show them in the near future. When Jesus was faced with a woman caught in adultery, as an angry crowd sought his approval for stoning, Jesus proclaimed himself to be the light of the world, one whose judgment and life are clear and empowering. Before Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he tells Martha that he is the resurrection and the life. The raising of Lazarus was indeed to show Jesus' power to give life now and to demonstrate his power to do what he proclaimed that he was sent to do. Each of these situations is interpreted by the appropriate I am statement. The I am statements of John's gospel help us identify Jesus as divine. Jesus himself explains that he and the Father are one, which was lost on many of those who were listening. They just couldn't get that principle. Today our study of Jesus' I am statements moves us on a bit to the 10th chapter of John. We've looked at 6, 8, and now we're at the beginning of 10. Uh, we'll see another one in 10 next week, but we're looking at the very beginning of chapter 10 this week. He uses a metaphor, and a metaphor, uh, an idea, that, uh, uh, an image, a picture that the people should have understood. He used something that was tangible. Oftentimes when Jesus taught and preached, he would use the things around him, something the people could identify with. Flowers and grass and sheep and all kinds of uh, things that he would use to try and help them understand. And today is no different as we look at the next I am statement. He uses verbal images of sheep and shepherds and thieves and sheepfolds and doors. I'm going to go ahead and read this uh, now so we have kind of a springboard to move from. And it's right at the beginning of John chapter 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, He who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger... They simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. Now, this was a common enough uh, image for the people of Israel. They lived very close to the ground, so to speak. They were agricultural as their base. They um, were tied to things that were happening uh, as far as farming and seeding and shepherding and all of that. So Jesus' use of this analogy would have been something that most everybody could identify with. In fact, it was a metaphor that had been used many times by God, uh, the prophets speaking, the idea of sheep and shepherds and sheepfolds and all of that was something that was a common point for God to use to try to get uh, a principle across to the people. We see back in Jeremiah 23, woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and and, uh, have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. I will also raise up shepherds over them, and they will tend them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. 
Now, this is not the core of the sermon, but just stop for a moment and think about what Jeremiah just said, what God said through his prophet Jeremiah. Think how pertinent it, pertinent it is today. When God is talking about shepherds that have driven the sheep away, that have, have led them into false areas, is that a metaphor that could be used today? Absolutely, there are all kinds of shepherds who have led the sheep off into the wrong places. And it's interesting that God says, I'm going to raise up good shepherds, loyal, godly shepherds, the right kind of shepherds to, to lead my people into places of health and wholeness. But it's a really sad thing to think that there are shepherds that are actually destroying sheep. And that didn't only happen back in Jeremiah's day. It happened today. It happens today. Where there are shepherds who have a title, who have a role, but they're leading people away from God, away from his word. So let's take a minute and let's kind of, uh, we were just uh, at this last week, we celebrated Esther's birthday and we went to Sight and Sound. By the way, if you have not had a chance to see the uh, production Esther, um, not this Esther, <coughs> she's our production. Um, I encourage you to see it. It really is a wonderful presentation. Um, but one of the things we noticed, we got down and we, we sat in our seats and we looked at one another and went, none of us have a program. Now, we know the story, so it's not like you need a program, but it's kind of nice to see who's who and what's coming and all that stuff. So we wanted to get a program. So now, before we move into our passage, we're going to take a minute and look at John 10 and kind of see who the characters are, see who the cast is in this story, okay? So we start off with the sheep. Uh, I, this may not be very flattering for you. Uh, most of you don't have experience with sheep, so it's kind of a benign metaphor, but if you worked with sheep uh, and someone called you a sheep, would that be a, very affirming? No, in fact, uh, there's a, a video. I wish we were not outside today because I was going to show you a video. You've probably seen it floating around the internet. Um, this kid is helping a sheep get out of a ditch, okay? And so he pulls the sheep out of the ditch, and you'd think, oh, the sheep would turn around and just be so grateful for that. Instead, it jumps over here and jumps back into the ditch. And you shake your head and you go, what a stupid sheep. And then you stop for a minute and go, the Bible says I'm a sheep. How often has, hasn't God saved me from one problem or another, from myself, and then I just jump back in the ditch again? It happens all the time. So in this analogy, we see the sheep, God's favorite animal when speaking of the people. Luther put it this way. This simple creature, the sheep, has this special note among all animals that it quickly hears the voice of the shepherd, follows no one else. It depends entirely on him and seeks help from him alone and cannot help itself, but is shut up to another's aid. When you look at a sheep, they have very little to offer defensively. They're pretty much, you know, pretty low on the totem pole as far as independence goes. They're absolutely dependent on those around them, at least to stay healthy. And so are we. Then you have the sheepfold, and that is the church of God. That place of safety, sanctuary, and feeding for the sheep. I'm not talking about the building. Sometimes we confuse the sheepfold or the church with the building. Are we in a church? Are we in the sheepfold right now? Yes, we are. Do we have to be across the street? No, we don't. It's handy. It's air conditioned. It's dry. So there are advantages to being in the building, but that doesn't limit the sheepfold. Now in the Bible, there was a very specific understanding of what a sheepfold was. A sheepfold had walls. Was that to be uh, harsh on the sheep? Was that to be confining for the sheep? No, it was to be a place of safety for the sheep. 
To be part of the body of Christ, part of the family of God, is to be in a safe place. Sometimes I'll hear people say, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, no, technically that's true, but then you're a sitting duck for the enemy. There is no place of refuge. There's no place of support. There's no place of safety. There's a reason that God says, don't uh, deny getting together with one another, my paraphrase. Because basically what you're saying is, I don't need a sheepfold. But a sheepfold is a place of safety. We learned something many years ago. We had a black lab, and it was a wonderful dog, um, but we, we uh, basically tied it up outside, you know, when we had it outside. And we thought, hey, that's fine. But we noticed over the years that it began to get um, more and more aggressive. And we couldn't understand why this dog was becoming more aggressive rather than more familiar and friendly. Until later, after you know, many years later, um, somebody had said, what would you do when you put the dog outside? Well, we tied it up on a chain. You didn't have a kennel? N no, we didn't have a kennel. We put it on a chain. We thought that would be better for it to have more room to run on the chain. And they said, that's your problem. I don't understand, I said. Uh, they said, they are unprotected on a chain. They will become more aggressive because they feel unguarded. A kennel, which many people think are, is, is a horrible thing, actually is a place of safety. If there are people or animals that come and they don't recognize it, they don't know, they, they get fearful, they have no place to hide in a kennel they feel uh, a little bit of protection from those. And it was interesting because we saw the same thing in cattle out in South Dakota. One time I, I asked uh, where this farmer was and the, the wife said, oh, he's, he's out by the, the cattle, checking on the cattle. I said, well, thanks. You know, we're talking hundreds of acres here. Where am I gonna find him? Which way is the wind coming? I thought, what does that matter? Go into the wind as far as you can in the pasture you'll find him. Sure enough, I figured out where the wind was coming from, drove out to his pasture, in the far corner, as far as you could go, against the wind, that's where all the cattle were. Because they felt protected by the gate, or by the fence, and they could smell, you know, when the enemy, the scent of the enemy. The sheepfold serves a positive role here in this story. Sheepfold shouldn't be confused with confinement in a negative sense. It's protection. So you have the sheep, you have the sheepfold, the doorkeeper, the owner of the sheep. In this case, that would be God the Father, the owner of all sheep, all believers in the family of God. And then the fourth member of the cast here would be the shepherd, the faithful servant of God, and in this situation, now not to be confused with the next I am statement, but in this situation, this would be talking about faithful pastors and shepherds, I mean uh, prophets, who are acting as the shepherds. How do you tell this person apart from the thief? We just read in a little bit, how can you tell a good shepherd from a bad shepherd? How do they get into the sheepfold? Are they going by way of the door? or are they going over the sheepfold wall? Whether that be rock or, or uh, bushes or different ways that they made sheepfolds back then. But you, how do you tell a good one from a bad one? What is their relationship to the door? I found that rather interesting. Robbers, thieves, false prophets, and deceivers continually try to gain access illegally. They seek to scare the sheep, disrupt the once peaceful sheepfold, and steal the marginalized, those that are on the fringes. They try to knock them off. Nevertheless, the people didn't catch on to Jesus' symbolism. So, you see him continue. We've already read the first six verses, talks a little bit about what's going on there, and you can probably see the glassy eyes staring back. The same ones I see once in a while on Sunday morning. <laughs> when you realize, okay, I gotta go a step further here. Jesus, as the perfect teacher, realized that he needed to go a little further, that they still weren't getting it. 
And so we see him continue in verse 7. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. He says it twice. Do you think they would have gotten the, the point at that? I am. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We like to quote that last phrase there, that last line. But we need to understand the context. The thief comes to do his, his dastardly deeds. But how do you stay safe from the thief? By getting into the sheepfold. By coming by way of the door. To say, to focus our attention on uh, this nasty guy, the thief, and to see all of the horrible things the thief does, is focusing on the wrong part of the story. Jesus' part of the story, the part that he wanted to get across, was not what the thief can do, but it's how to stay safe. How do you stay away from all these horrible, uh, the horrible impact of the thieves and the robbers? You got to get in the sheepfold. You got to come by way of the door. Having addressed his previous points in verses 1 through 6, Jesus explains the missing piece of the puzzle, and that is the door. The key to the whole image is the door. How do you tell a good shepherd from a bad one? You watch how they enter the sheepfold. Do they climb over the fence, shrubs, uh, thistles, a uh, rock wall? Like I said, the sheepfold may have been made up of a variety of different things, depending on what was available at the time there in, in the pasture. Okay? So if you want to, uh, it's interesting, if you were there and you saw somebody crawling over the wall, you could fairly assume what? They weren't the real shepherd. Their motivation was, was nasty, was bad. Now they may say, oh, wait, I, I forgot my key, you know? Or I, I didn't want to walk all the way around. No, excuses. And we face the same thing today. If you see people that are making excuses, ways around getting around, going through Jesus, you find people coming up with all kinds of rationalizations and excuses. It really is fairly simple to tell a good shepherd from a bad one. Do they, how do they recognize Christ? Do they come by way of Jesus? And I'm not talking about a, 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 a a cheap grace. I'm talking about a biblical Jesus. How do they handle the door? Those who came before Christ, the false prophets and the illegitimate religious leaders, did not gain access by way of the door. Uh, if you want to go back in the Old Testament, all ever since Genesis 3, uh, you can point to what has, some have called a scarlet thread. What I mean by that is, was Jesus present in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Not only by way of visitations and things like that, um, but we see this thread of the Redeemer all the way through. From Genesis chapter 3, in the midst of the curse, the idea of the seed, the serpent's head, all of that. And then going all the way through, we see the reality and the need, the reality of sin, the need of a Savior, and the coming Messiah and all of that. All of the rituals, all of the sacrifices, all of that pointed to this, this uh, scarlet thread running through. But there were those, even in the Old Testament, who distracted, who got people off track, who were leading in self-righteous ways, who were leading in ways of works righteousness, uh, that saw the sacrifices and rituals as an end to themselves, missing the significance of the, the one who they were intended to point to. So when Jesus says those who came before were robbers and thieves and all of that, 
He was talking about those who were directing attention away from the Messiah, away from the Father, and on to themselves. Personal agendas, personal gain, self-righteous motivations, works righteousness, all of those things. By their compromise, their deceit and pride, these false shepherds had tried to lead the sheep in false directions. But the true sheep were not deceived. They could see through the lies and hypocrisy of those robbers and thieves. Unfortunately, they were in the minority. As has always been the case, God talks about a remnant. A remnant implies the rest, a small amount. When Elijah is going before the Father, going before God, he's, he's talking about how he's the only one and, and how horrible it is to be the only one, the last one left. What is God's response? Elijah, I've got 7,000 more like you. Now that may sound like a small number in comparison to the millions of those who have, to use our vernacular, swallowed the Kool-Aid. But the bottom line is God has always promised a remnant. And the challenge is to be part of the remnant. I think sometimes we fall for the, de the deception that there will somehow be a time when you know, the whole nation will come to understand who God is. Is that a biblical perspective? No, it's not. Would it be wonderful? Absolutely, it'd be fantastic if we all had a biblical foundation and we were all making decisions in a righteous way. That would be fantastic, but it's not biblical. The reality is that we will always be on, in the minority. The challenge is to convince as many people as possible that God's word is true and Christ is the redeemer that our place needs to be uh, in connection with the Father and His Holy Spirit moving and free to move in our midst. That's always going to be our challenge. But we can't fall for the deception that one day, you know, the whole nation will be following. We do know that there will be a day, a day in glory when all knees will bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, but not all of those confessing will recognize him as their Lord. Even enemies someday will realize, oh wow, I missed the boat on this one, and it'll be too late. <clears throat> Jesus continues with his lesson, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. But what is the full connotation of Jesus as the door? To help us answer this, let's look at another reference. We turn to um, Ezekiel this time. The first one was Jeremiah. Ezekiel is this passage. I will feed them in a good pasture, and their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lie down in good grazing ground and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will lead them to rest. Was the sheepfold a place for feeding? No, the pastures were a place for grazing, for feeding. What was the place, the role of the sheepfold? Safety. Safety, rest. It gave the sheep an opportunity to just relax. Remember what I said about the doe earlier. You know, to seemingly, seemingly not have a care in the world. The sheepfold was a place of safety and security. The church the people of God, should be a place of safety and security for believers to run to. All too often, the church is a place where you look over your shoulder wondering who's going to come at you next. Now, I'm not saying that, from a, you know, that it always is that way, but sadly, the church is an extension of the world where people are too quick to, to stab in the back and to make accusations and to to condescend. That shouldn't be, folks. That shouldn't be. The sheepfold is a place of rest, of security, of safety. 
And when people flock to the sheepfold, when they come in through the door, and again, who is the door? It's Jesus. So I'm not talking about intruders, invaders, false teachers, false prophets. I'm talking about those who uh, come in honestly, humbly, through the door. They should not find the church to be a place of accusation or condemnation. They should find the church to be a, safe, a place of safety and rest. They get plenty of the other outside the sheepfold. They shouldn't have to worry about it in the sheepfold. He promises that the day will come when his people, his flock, would be whole and blessed. Their healing and restoration would come and it would be complete, but not for all. Now I've kind of gone ahead, now I'm gonna go back to the passage because I think it's important to understand Again, we're not talking about a universalism, even within the church. We're going to go back to the Ezekiel passage. I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. Now that is a pretty harsh condemnation. He says, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna find all of those that are lost, those without a sheepfold, those that are wandering around, I'm gonna bring them back to that place of safety. I'm gonna bring them back to the sheepfold. But, there are some sheep that he's gonna deal harshly with. Who are those sheep? Now we're talking about sheep in the sheepfold. I don't know how this messes with your theology, but there are those within the sheepfold who don't have really good attitudes and are self-centered and self-righteous and in it only for themselves. Jesus refers to them as the fat and the strong I will destroy. Now stop for a minute. Isn't that the kind of sheep you want? Fat and strong sheep? Why would there be such a strong condemnation towards the fat and the strong? Anybody? Good question. Good question. Thank you, Ed. How did they get so fat and strong? At the cost of what? The point here is that they got fat and strong, or as we might say, fat and sassy, at the expense of the others in the sheepfold. Their gorging themselves led to the leanness of other sheep. Their self-motivated attitudes led to the marginalization of others. And so though God is going to bring in those that have been hurt, those that have been broken, those that need his protection into the sheepfold, there are going to be those within the sheepfold who due to wrong motives have gotten fat and sassy and are not going to deal rightly with others in the sheep, sheepfold, especially these that are brought in. And unfortunately we do see that in the church. We see those that are self-motivating, self-righteous, who seem to feed on the hardship of others. And God goes, no, that has no place. No place in the sheepfold. It's interesting that Paul, as he's writing to the Corinthians in chapter 11 of uh, 1 Corinthians, that's the passage that we get a lot of our instruction from uh, communion. It's the context of that is that there were people who were coming to church and they'd brought all this food and they were sharing with their friends and family and they were leaving nothing for others. They were not sharing with others on the margins who were sitting on the ends of the tables. So there were people going hungry while see other people feasted. There wasn't a mutual concern for all. There was a marginalization. 
And Paul goes, this should never be. This should never be. When you come together, you wait. And you celebrate the Lord's Supper, not as a meal, as a feast, but understanding what it really is. Celebrating the body and blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus for the sins of all. And nobody should be left out. You shouldn't find hungry people at the table. But that's what was happening here, and Jesus uses it as in his metaphor. Those that come in the sheepfold through the door should all be treated alike. They shouldn't be fat and sassy and starving in the sheepfold. The sheepfold should be a place of safety and refuge for all. Not only does the door guard against lawless intruders, we've been focusing on that, but it also acts as a barrier against straying sheep. It keeps the evil out, yes, but it also keeps the wayward sheep from pursuing evil, assuming the sheep don't jump the gate. And that sometimes happens. Sometimes there are sheep that go, I want what I want, when I want it, and they jump the fence, they jump the gate. You know, uh, there are those who do that. But there are also those that are innocently wayward. And the door keeps them from getting into trouble. So on one hand, we talk about Jesus being the door as the way to enter, but if we look to Christ, if we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, it'll also keep us from getting off track. It'll also keep us from straying into areas of hardship and danger. Again, in our culture, we're, we're told that the sheepfold is a bad thing, constraining. If you really want to have fun, if you really want to have your way, then break free of your confinement. But the Bible says that the sheepfold is a good place, a place of rest. And the door is not only a, a way to safely get in, but it also keeps you from getting out when you shouldn't be. To look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, not only is a way to get in, but it keeps us from wandering. It keeps us from getting out and being endangered. The door is the only way of admission to all the blessings, the provision, the rest, and safety of the sheepfold. Commentator Matthew Henry observes this way, Christ is the door. And what greater security has the church of God than that the Lord Jesus is between it and all its enemies? He is a door open for passage and communication. Here are plain directions how to come into the fold. We must come in by Jesus Christ as the door, by faith in him as the great mediator between God and man. Christ has all that care of his church. And every believer which a good shepherd has of his flock. And he expects the church and every believer to wait on him and to keep in his pasture. And I'm going to close with this challenge. We are surrounded by all kinds of things that clamor for our attention. All kinds of things that will compete with our faith. Last night, uh, Esther came home from work, and uh, we were just flipping through some, some things, just kind of getting settled in, and she turned on a TV show. We never watch um, regular TV anymore. We'll, we'll put in a movie or watch a mystery or something like that. But while we were just getting settled in, she happened to turn on the TV, and there was this show, the end of a show. And I'm not going to say which one, because it could be any number of shows nowadays. But we watched the last five minutes of the show. And we sat there and just kind of looked at each other and went, really? It ended with two very clear messages. One dealt with sanctity of life. No, there isn't any sanctity of life in general. And number two is um, assisted suicide. In this particular show, um, a doctor did something earlier, and uh, someone, another senior doctor said, well, you're going to have to go make this right. And so it shows them going back in saying, okay, um, these are some things we can do to help end your life. Five minutes. 
Five minutes. And I thought, <laughs> you know, Lord, how many people aren't watching this stuff and getting this infusion regularly and then have very little time for the word, very little time for the door? Are they going to be nourished? Are they going to be safe? Are they going to be at peace? Absolutely not, because the stuff that many people are getting out there is stuff fed to them by the robbers and thieves, the false teachers. To have a sheepfold to go to, a door to walk through that both allows entrance and guards against straying. It's a good thing, saints. It's a good thing. Jesus stands as the only way of admittance, but he also stands against all those who would enter for purposes of bloodshed or personal gain. For while the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus came that all true sheep, all those who come through the door of faith in Christ, might have life and have it abundantly. That's the promise we have for all in the sheepfold. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you that we have this promise, this absolute certainty that as we come into the sheepfold through the door being you, that we will find rest, security, protection, provision. And in this life, where we're told there is no security, that is an amazing promise to know we are safe in the sheepfold of God. In your name, amen. Amen.